Uh, gracious Heavenly Father, uh, we are humbled this morning that you would care to share this time with us, and we bless you that you've put it on our heart uh, to come into your house and to share this time with you. Uh, a precious time, uh, an ordained time, and a time where, where we pray that you would touch our hearts and that you would speak to our hearts and you would bring great comfort and peace and joy and even power in the Holy Spirit. That as we uh, share this time, Lord, as we meet with you, that we would sense your presence, that we would know that we've been with you. Uh, that's more important, Lord, than anything else that uh, happens uh, today uh, in this service. Uh, we pray that you would use it all, uh, that we might meet you today, and that you might speak to our hearts, uh, that you might share in this time. And it's also our prayer that as we share in this time that we lift up the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who has loved us and died for us with an everlasting love and promises to come again and receive us to himself that uh, where he is we may be also. And we bless you uh, for those wonderful promises and for those thoughts. Uh, Father, we want to lift up Martha this morning. Uh, a lot of injuries, a lot of serious injuries, but we pray that you would use this uh, as a time to draw her closer and that her faith and her walk with you would be stronger. And this would be a turning point, um, a memorial stone uh, for how you've delivered her and how you're with her. So we pray that uh, Martha uh, would be encouraged of heart mind, body, and soul today. And also, Father, too, I uh, lift up Mike. Uh, bless you for Mike and Carol, and we thank you for their faith. Uh, we ask that you would give back to Mike what the stroke has taken. Uh, Lord, much in the same way that you've done that for Liz Gillette, I pray that you would touch Mike's body where he would get full mobility, uh, be able to walk uh, without a limp, and that he would uh, be a walking witness and testimony. And Lord, even if you don't heal him to that extent, I pray that you would uh, always, he would always have a song and, and a praise in his heart and on his lips uh, for a savior. Uh, so I lift up Mike this morning. Uh, also, Father, I'm ever mindful of Sandy and Gil as shut-ins uh, bless their heart, uh, fill their heart with great peace and joy and give them comfort. And also, Father, too, thank you for uh, Cindy uh, being here this morning. And thank you for the healing. Uh, thank you for the medical knowledge that you've given doctors to be able to put her ankle back together. And thank you for the way in which you protected her in that accident and um, many months ago. Uh, and I pray that you would touch her body in a way where she knows that she's getting better and better. Uh, also, uh, Lord, too, uh, for all of us this morning, we pray that you would give us the desires of our heart for our loved ones, our family, uh, those, Lord, uh, that do not walk with you or do not know you. Uh, we lift them up this day. You, you know it completely, and we lift them up this day. We pray that uh, you would use others, our testimonies, uh, the scripture we share, uh, the prayers we lift up to bring them to a saving uh, knowledge uh, of faith. Uh, also, Lord, too, uh, can't, uh, can't, I cannot close this time in prayer without thinking of our country, uh, our leaders, uh, the chaos that reigns uh, in the streets uh, because of evildoers, and we ask and pray, Heavenly Father, that you would raise up people that would have moral fortitude and leadership, uh, that they would deal with us. And we pray, um, uh, we pray, Lord, that it would be dealt with in a healthy way and not in a negative way or a violent way. But we, we, we care for our country, we love our country, we're concerned about our country, and we know, Lord, that this is, um, uh, we're, we're reaping what we've sown because we've left you and we've kicked you out 
of our discourse. And we, um, so we ask, Father, that, that you would divinely step in, that you would will it, that there would be peace and not chaos in our streets. Uh, also, Lord, too, uh, our heart breaks uh, with what Paulette shared this morning about the Massachusetts legislature um, affirming abortion and uh, promoting it aggressively. Uh, and this, it's not only this state, Lord, uh, but it's from the federal level on down. And uh, we, um, we shudder, Lord, for our country, and we fear for uh, what people think is right, and yet uh, it's ungodly, it's sinful, and uh, it's destructive. And um, uh, we, we know you'll judge it, and so we lift up our country. Uh, we pray that you would raise up people and leaders um, that would know you, that wouldn't embrace um, wickedness and uh, evil rules and promote them. Uh, we, we thank you that we're part of a, a, of a heavenly country uh, whose builder and maker is God. And we, as I prayed, Lord, in the prayer closet, may you give us the grace to fix our eyes upon Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Uh, Dave, scripture reading? Bill. Our first reading this morning is from the third letter of John. It's found on page 1188 of the Red Pew Bible. The elder, to my dear friend Gaius, whom I love in the truth, dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and all that may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. It gave me great joy to have some brothers come and tell me about your faithfulness to the truth and how you continue to walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. The word of the Lord. Amen. Thanks, Bill. This morning's second scripture reading, we go back to the beginning from the book of Genesis, the fifth chapter, be reading verses 18 through 24, and that can be found on page five in the Red Pew Bible. In the fifth chapter of Genesis, verses 18 through 24. When Jared had lived 162 years, he became the father of Enoch. After he became the father of Enoch, Jared lived 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Jared lives a total of 962 years, and then he died. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. After he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked faithfully with God 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Enoch lived a total of 365 years. Enoch walked faithfully with God, then he was no more because God took him away. May the Lord add his blessing. And some of you folks thought or think that you're old. <laughs> You've got nothing on Enoch or Methuselah or these other great saints here. This morning I want to talk to you about walking with God. What does this mean? How was this done? What's the picture and the devotional thought? I'm going to try to answer those questions this morning. Uh, let's pray first. Uh, gracious Heavenly Father, uh, open the eyes of our hearts and open these scriptures to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So folks, uh, upon reading this account uh, regarding Enoch, uh, it's, you're kind of actually left with a sense of wow. Uh, Enoch walked faithfully with God for 300 years and he was no longer. God took him. That's, that's a sense of wow. And I would suggest to you that God took him in a nanosecond, right? Um, if, you, if you notice here, uh, and you can't help but notice it, uh, verse 24 ends very abruptly. It's like, done. Enoch's gone, right? And I would suggest to you that it, that makes the verse that much more significant. Uh, God took Enoch, and so... What lasting impression does that leave all of us today? Uh, what lasting impression did this have upon those who knew Enoch? I mean, how many people did Enoch know in that day? How did this affect his friends and family? I mean, you know, some of us have woken up and loved ones have not been here, right? It hurts. Uh, what sense was left with his sons and daughters. You know, uh, were they more devoted to God after this? Or were they angry at God? Because God took their loved one. And what about Enoch's wife? I mean, surely he had a wife, he had kids, right? What'd she think? I'm sure she also grieved too, right? I mean, it's not like she told Enoch to go out and get a gallon of milk and a loaf of bread and he never returned again, right? They didn't have supermarkets back in that day. He would have had to go out into the field and milk a cow, right? Um, you know, I had a guy tell me, I think I told this years ago, I had a guy tell me I used to work with, he knew of a guy. His wife asked him to go get a, a gallon of milk and a loaf of bread. And he came back five years later. It's a true story. It's like, you know, I always said, well, you know, Mel, did he bring the milk and loaf of bread? Uh, crazy. I had to make a joke of that because it's tough to fathom what some people do, right? So when you look at this passage, uh, you know, I would say that Enoch has left us a lasting legacy and an impressionable one. Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him. The other thing I want you to notice here, which is very impressionable in the account, and, it, and you can easily gloss over it, because this is a chapter on a genealogy. Now, you know what genealogies do? They put most of us to sleep. And a lot of times we struggle to say, why is the genealogy there? What's the purpose of it? Well, it lends... It lends credence and credibility to the history and the divine account of Holy Scripture. Where do you get all these names from? Who comes up with them? Only God, God knew all these people. And the Holy Spirit gave Moses the knowledge and the ability to write this and record it. So that's the reason for the genealogy. And it's a point of reference and a connection to the past from the very beginning. So take a look at the genealogy here. It gives us names of people, ages, when their first child was born, how long they lived. And yet in every single verse in this chapter, what does the individual genealogy end with? And he died. Not so with Enoch. Of all the people listed here, Enoch is singled out for his walk with God, and he did not die. Now, I would suggest to you that other people walked with God too. But Enoch is doubly twice mentioned, verse 22 and 24, emphasis regarding his walk. Uh, you know, this kind of just shows up in the middle of a genealogy. It kind of reminds it. Remember we did the prayer of Jabez in 1 Chronicle 4? And you're reading about all these names, and all of a sudden you read about Jabez's prayer. Like, out of nowhere. Right? Like, just great redeeming value. Here's the other thing that I think is so impressionable, and I want you to think about this. Enoch is the first man 
who cheats death. He thwarts death. He doesn't die. And isn't that a beautiful picture of a down payment for what God plans to ultimately do through the person of Jesus Christ? We'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. And, and so Enoch here does not die a natural death, natural physical death. Uh, and he died is not in his, his, his obituary. Think about that. You know, you read obituaries, and oh, the so-and-so passed away at a certain time and certain place, and with loved ones, not with Enoch. Uh, actually, one, one commentator said that Adam, at this point, based on the age, was the only person to have died at this point. Naturally, I'm not talking about the killings that happened in Genesis 4 with Abel and Lamech boasting about how he killed a couple people, right? The other thing that I think is really impressionable here with this text, and you probably know this, this text is used as a proof text for the rapture or what we call the translation. You know, God coming and just removing you, right? And this is what happened, what happened to Enoch here actually seems to agree with what the Apostle Paul writes to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51. He says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, we shall, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Now, Paul's talking to the church about the upcoming rapture. And that, no doubt, will be a glorious time. Uh, who knows if we're going to be here during that time? But that's what's going to happen. It's going to be like an Enoch moment. And that's glorious. But here's, here's the other thing that's glorious. That, and I don't want to focus so much on the rapture. This is glorious here, and this is the point. Walking with God is just as glorious as the rapture. It's a glorious and raptured moment. To walk with God. That's an incredible thing, folks. In fact, if you take a look, his walk was the very reason why God raptured him, right? So when we walk with God, it's glorious and it's rapturous, so to speak. If that's even a word, rapturous. Now, here's the other thing I want to point out about the text. Because there's multiple Enochs in Scripture, let's get the right Enoch. The Enoch in Genesis 5 has nothing to do with the Enoch in Genesis 4. There was an Enoch that was Cain's firstborn, and he named the city after Cain, uh, uh, after Enoch. Cain did, all right? But I want you to notice that Scripture uh, employs a literary element, because you have the account of Cain and Abel, and then you have the, the Cain line, you know, the ungodly line addressed, right? It's presented, and it's like, okay, we're done with the ungodly people. That's how the scripture presents it. Because we want to focus now on the people who walk with God, who love God, who call upon the name of God. So if you take a look, uh, Enoch was Jared's son. Enoch was also the father of Methuselah, the oldest guy who ever lived in Scripture, right? Or recorded in Scripture. We also know, according to Jude, verse 14, that Enoch was the seventh generation from Adam. You count seven people down, right? The other thing is, Enoch also prophesied in the power of the Holy Spirit. He was prophetic. And then we also have uh, Enoch mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5. And, and you know Hebrews 11 is the chapter on faith, people exhibiting great, great faith, right? And it talks about Enoch's faith and his witness and how Enoch was pleasing to God. So these are all significant truths because what it does is it helps us have a composite sketch of the person of Enoch. Uh, one person wrote this in summing up Enoch's walk. The language seems to express the character in the conduct 
of one imminent for his love and devotedness to the service of God. Get this. This must have been a man of astonishing life, marvelous character, that he should be singled out in this way. Uh, think about it. We're going to we're going to meet Enoch someday. Isn't that kind of cool? Right? And all the other great saints. And here's the other thing I want you to stop and consider for a moment. Enoch lived in what is called the Andaluvian period. That's a big word for basically saying pre-flood. Right? He lived before the flood. And what do we know about the period before the flood? Great, great wickedness, great corruption. Great, great sin. Evil running rampant. Gee, kind of like our day and age, right? Uh, scripture says, death reigned from Adam to Moses. So what does that mean? It means that there was no written word of God. Enoch did not have a Bible to go to. What he had was oral tradition. Passed down from Adam and Eve, and to Seth, and to all the others that would be in the godly line. And this is an incredible thing, folks, when we talk about Enoch's faith, right? No Bible, no Bible to fall upon, just oral tradition. You know, you see, you see where the patriarchs, right? In, in Abraham's time, they, they put their hands upon their sons, and they, they passed off the blessing. They talked about knowing God. That was Enoch. And so it's in this context that Enoch is presented as a great man of faith. Because he walked with God. As someone else said, the whole tenor of his life was summed up in the words, he walked with God. That would be a great epitaph on your tombstone, wouldn't it? She walked with God. He walked with God. She loved God. He served God. Great epitaphs, right? Now, uh, so, a great, great testimony. I ask this question. So then, what does it mean to walk with God, right? So, um, have you ever asked somebody to go for a walk with you? Who walks? I try to walk. Okay. Have you ever asked somebody to walk with you? Uh, here we go. Has anyone ever asked you to walk with them? Okay. Here's the simple takeaway. You don't ask your enemy to take a walk with you. Have you ever asked your enemy to take a walk with you? Would you ever ask your enemy to take a walk with you? Absolutely not. Now, here you go. Uh, forget about asking the enemy. Would you ever ask somebody that you don't get along with to walk with you? No, I wouldn't. If somebody asked you to walk with them that you don't get along with, you'd probably say, you know, I'd really like to, but I've got a prior commitment. Right? That's what you'd say. You make something up. Right? I, I, by the way, that's a great uh, way to ruin some quiet time if you're walking and you're trying to, you know, pray to God. Or, uh, you know, what a, what a great time to ruin exercise, I suppose. Right? Uh, now, here's the other thing I want to say. Uh, Enoch is not the first to walk with God, right? Um, but Enoch is the first mentioned in Scripture in this way. Uh, scripture implies, by the way, that others walked with God before Enoch. I already talked about that, right? But if you go back to Genesis chapter 3, remember that the account says that God walked in the garden? So God walked with Adam and Eve. That also implies that Adam and Eve walked with God. But see, that was pre-fall. And in Enoch's case here, this is something Enoch did after the fall. So what's the picture of walking with God? It's, folks, it's a beautiful one. And I've just, this is what I've come up with on my own. Out of no commentaries, no, this is what it, what it means to me. All right? Companionship, friendship, unity. Communion, union, his presence. It's relational through and through. It's being on the same page. You know, we use that expression, oh, we're on the same page, right? Same goals going in the same direction. That's what it means. 
And I'm sure I've missed probably another 20 points about that. But here's the other thing I want to say. This is God's invitation to each one of us to walk with him. You know, I've said this before, you get, we get a lot of invitations to things. Weddings, you know, gatherings, you know, um, graduations. We've got a divine invitation to walk with God. What a great honor. Here's the other way uh, that might help us process this or look at walking with God. It's to be in step relationally. Remember the scripture says that David was a man after God's own heart? That's kind of what it is. It doesn't mean perfection, but it does mean motives, thoughts, words, actions. It encompasses all of that, right? Spiritually, it comes down to knowing God. Morally, it comes down to imitating God. In principle, it's identifying and standing with God. We talked about standing firm last week. Standing for what God stands for in a day and age where people try to move you off that mark. Uh, so what I did was I looked up the word walk in, in the Bible and it occurs hundreds of times. But here's the basic idea. The basic idea is movement. It's just general movement, right? And this is why it's translated in context, often, often it's translated the word walk. But here's the significance of it. Metaphorically, it refers to a path that one takes in life. And it's used of one's life and one's behavior. So when it talks about Enoch walking with God, it was talking about his lifestyle, his way of life. Here you go. Second uh, Chronicles 17, verse 3. The scripture says, And the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he followed the example, that is, literally walked, uh, uh, in his, the footsteps of his father David, uh, uh, David's earlier days and did not seek the Baals. He sought the God of his father, followed his commandments, and did not act as Israel did. Uh, and, but uh, 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 3 says, regarding Samuel's sons, it's the antithesis of this. His sons, however, did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after dishonest gain, and they took bribes and they perverted justice. You know, that must have just broken Samuel's heart, right? Oh, great man of God, and uh, his kids did not walk with God. They were more in step with the world. And what does James say? That when you're in step with the world, you're a friend of the world. It's hostile to God. The prophet Amos in chapter 3, verse 3 said, Do two people walk together unless they have agreed to meet? It's a rhetorical question. Just like we would not ask an enemy or someone that we don't get along with to take a walk with us, God raises the question to his people. And the answer is no. God doesn't walk with people who are not on the same page. He refuses to do so. I believe years ago I did a message on walking with God, and I used this illustration. Some of you may not have been here. I'll use it again. In high school, I was in the drill team, in the color guard. You know, you carry a flag, you spin a rifle. It was part of the band unit. Didn't play an instrument, but it was part of the band unit. And we, wa we, we marched along, you know, in formation, in step, like you would do in the military, right? You were expected to be in step. You trained for it. And if you got out of step, you'd have to skip to get back into step, right? It was choreographed. You worked at it. And if you got out of step, you didn't feel very good. You knew when you were out of step. Because as you're walking along, you know, peripheral vision would allow you to see how other people moved. And you could tell whether you were with them or weren't with them, right? When you messed up, you felt bad. Because you messed everybody else up. And if you were in harmony, you felt really good about your effort. 
being in step. Now, most of us are familiar with the, uh, with the poem Footprints, right? I know one person in our church has the poem, the poem Footprints um, on a plaque in their family room. Uh, footprints, you've heard it before. You know, it's about one foot of set footprints in the sand. It's a picture of uh, one set of footprints and God, you know, carrying the saint during the real difficult time, right? Great poem, great message, but there's only one problem with that picture. That's not the picture that Scripture puts forth in walking with God. If you take a look at the back of the bulletin, it's act, this morning, it's actually more like that. And, and, and on the back of the bulletin, it's actually got like three footprints, like, you know, right in a row. But the idea, the idea is in sync together. Not one set of footprints, but two. That's the idea. This past uh, September, we went down to the Outer Banks, a gracious invitation by my sister and brother-in-law. And we went down as a family. First time in probably 15 or 16 years we were all together as a family. But every single day, since I've lost all this weight, every single day I'm trying to do something to keep moving to try to keep it off, right? So I, every single day I walked the beach. And most days I had shoes on. But there was like at least one particular day where I took the shoes off, you know, and um, I walked in the water. And, you know, there's something really refreshing and re liberating about that, right? Marie used to be a beach person. You go to the water, you hear the waves breaking, you're walking, you're strolling, and it's just something really cool. As long as, like, the water's not freezing, right? And as long as you don't step on a crab, or as long as you don't cut your toe on a seashell, it's all cool, right? Okay. <laughs> You know, I was thinking about that. You know, walking with God is so refreshing, isn't it? It's beautiful. It's spiritually liberating in the truth. It's spiritually illuminating. You have the mind of God, the heart of Christ. It's spiritually invigorating to emulate God. I mean, that's, that's refreshing, folks. It's a breath of fresh air in a sinful environment and world. I mean, we're like little Christs, if you will, walking around, refreshing and bringing life to wherever we go. That's invigorating. Uh, walking with God brings peace and joy to the heart. It's wholesomeness to the soul. It's life and marrow to the bones and one's body. It's a life of goodness. It's a life full of grace. It's a righteous life. And that's the only way to fly, or in this case, walk. Right? It's the only way to go. It's raptured, it's glorious, it's divine. It's life in Christ. You know, John chapter 1, he talks about the spark. Christ is that life and light that was lost at the fall. And he came to bring that life and light to each and every one who simply believes. It's a picture of divine fellowship. And it's something that God has secured for us. Oh, so precious. And it's something that we're encouraged to walk in. And we're challenged to walk in and maintain. That's the hard part. That's the hard part. Because you know, sometimes I just want to go the other way. You know, we talk about running, Cindy. Just want to run. Go on. Not gone as quick as Enoch, but gone. Gone like Jonah. Uh, this is the essence of what it means to walk with God. Now, another question. How did Enoch walk? What does the scripture say? He walked by faith. And this is what, it implies the opposite of sight. He didn't have to see God. You know, some people have to see God. Hebrews 11.1, 1, as you know, gives us 
um, the closest definition that you have of faith. It's an assurance of eternal hope in God. It's a conviction that you know that there is something beyond this world, something greater than what we find in this world, and it's God. It's believing that God is, and it's simply keeping Him in the mix, bringing Him into our life. Sir Isaac Newton used to say, I have no genius, but I keep a subject before me. This is not... This, this is nothing about being a Rhodes Scholar or being genius. It's simply believing that God is. That's all it is. And that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Faith is about keeping God before us. It's trusting his character. That what he said, he'll accomplish. It's about trusting his word. It's about trusting him with our past, our present, and our future. Now, you might say, well... I got the present and the future, but why'd you say the past, Pastor? Because there's a lot of garbage and stuff that has happened in the past, and God uses it. That's why. I trust that what he's done in the past in my life, or what he did not do, I trust in him. If he doesn't move the mountains, I trust in him. I'm okay with that. The past is a big part of what God is doing in the present, and always in the future. One final thought that I want to leave with you folks, uh, and the picture, uh, with the picture here of walking by faith. Uh, Enoch is almost kind of like the universal picture and symbol of the hope of immortality. Think about that. Living on forever. You know, people do all sorts of things Hip replacements, heart replacements, lung re if they can do, I think they're doing lung replacements today. And they'll replace anything if they can, right? Just so people can live longer. But Enoch is a picture of the hope of immortality, life in God, living on forever. And this life comes by faith. It's as simple as that. The entire movement of Scripture from Genesis through Revelation is about finding faith in God. And that ultimately is fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. The whole movement of Scripture culminates in the person of Christ. Because he's the rock of ages. He's the God of the Old Testament. Only in faith, faith in God is, is there a sign of assurance and hope for life to come. Not going to find it here. Uh, Enoch's life is a model of a raptured life, of a trans, translated life, of a model for a bodily and spiritual resurrection someday. It's right here in the pages of Scripture. Resurrection and bodily and spiritually someday. And his life accentuates what is true about walking with God. It speaks to a raised life. If you walk with God, it speaks to a spiritually raised life. We're raised in Christ. And I remind you, as I did at the outset of the message, Enoch was raised because of his faith. God raised him up. He was pleasing to God. Uh, one scholar said it so eloquently. I want to read for you what he said because it just kind of blew me away. The, the idea expressed in the translation of Enoch is not an eccentric idea. It is a prominent thought of the Pentateuch, that is the five books of the Bible, the first five, and the latest sentiment of the Christian gospel. Jesus said, Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. That's the message of the gospel. And the writer, he goes on to write, quote, And there is something which enabled Enoch to rise even above the nobler of his contemporaries and which singled him out from the crowd. And this, was, and this something was just faith. I, I like that. Just faith. 
Faith is the one principle which explains all Enoch's eminence, all his nobility of character, all his victories. Enoch was always pleasing to God, but it was because he always believed and lived in the power of his faith. What a great, great quote. In other words, walking by faith pleases God and it leads to the gift of a resurrected life. Uh, I want to close here this morning with a uh, poem written by a minister, an uh, American Puritan minister, Thomas Shepard. And it's a poem about walking with God. And I'm not usually one into poetry, but I thought that this was pretty cool. Shepard writes, alas, and this, he lived about 400 years ago, so it's a little old English, but alas, my God, that we should be such strangers to each other. Oh, that as friends we might agree and walk and talk together. May I taste that communion, Lord, thy people have with thee. Thy spirit daily talks with them. Oh, let it talk with me. Like Enoch, let me walk with God and thus walk out my day, attended with the heavenly guards upon the king's highway. When wilt thou come unto me, O Lord? For till thou does appear, I count each moment for a day, each minute for a year. What he was saying in the end, he just longed to walk with God and to be in his presence, and he couldn't just wait. For that to happen. Uh, may that be true with me and each person here this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you uh, for the invitation to walk with you. And we thank you, Lord, that when we turn aside you're always willing to forgive us and get us back in step and pursue that glorious and raptured walk heavenward in the person of Jesus Christ. We thank you so very, very much for the gospel and thank you so very, very much for the gift of faith. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that that set Enoch apart. Uh, we know that that pleased you. Uh, we pray, Lord, that our faith would set us apart, that our faith, too, might please you, and that our walk may please you as well. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you for this time. We want to give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.